Book One, Part Six of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book One, Part Six. June Fourth to June Sixteenth, eighteen sixty two. June 4th. Miriam and Mattie drove in, in the little buggy, last evening after sunset, to find out what we were to do. Our condition is desperate. Beauregard is about attacking these Federals. They say he is coming from Corinth, and the fight will be in town. If true, we are lost again. Starvation at Greenwell, fever and bullets here, will put an end to us soon enough. There is no refuge for us, no one to consult. Brother, whose judgment we rely on as implicitly as we did on father's, we hear has gone to New York. There is no one to advise or direct us, for if he is gone, there is no man in Louisiana whose decision I would blindly abide by. Let us stay and die. We can only die once. We can suffer a thousand deaths with suspense and uncertainty. The shortest is the best. Do you think the few words here can give an idea of our agony and despair? Nothing can express it. I feel a thousand years old today. I have shed the bitterest tears today that I have shed since father died. I can't stand it much longer. I'll give way presently, and I know my heart will break. Shame! Where is God? A fig for your religion if it only lasts while the sun shines. Better days are coming. I can't. Troops are constantly passing and repassing. They have scoured the country for ten miles out in search of guerrillas. We are here without servants, clothing, or the bare necessities of life. Suppose they should seize them on the way. I procured a pass for the wagon. But it now seems doubtful if I can get the latter, a very faint chance. Well, let them go, our home next, then we can die, sure enough. With God's help, I can stand anything yet in store for me. I hope to die shouting, The Lord will provide. Poor Lavinia, if she could only see us, I am glad she does not know our condition. 5 p.m. What a day of agony, doubt, uncertainty, and despair! Heaven save me from another such! Every hour fresh difficulties arose, until I believe we were almost crazy, every one of us. As Miriam was about stepping in the buggy to go to Greenwell to bring in our trunks, Mother's heart misgave her, and she decided to sacrifice her property rather than remain in this state any longer. After a desperate discussion which proved that each argument was death, she decided to go back to Greenwell and give up the keys of the house to General Williams and let him do as he pleased, rather than have it broken open during her absence. Matty and Mr. Tunnard were present at the discussion, which ended by the latter stepping in the buggy and driving Miriam to the garrison. General Williams called her by name and asked her about Major Drum. It seems all these people, native and foreign, know us, while we know none. Miriam told him our condition, how our brothers were away, father dead, and mother afraid to remain, yet unwilling to lose her property by going away, how we three were alone and unprotected here, but would remain rather than have our home confiscated. He assured her the house should not be touched that it would be respected in our absence as though we were in it, and he would place a sentinel at the door to guard it against his own men who might be disposed to enter. The latter she declined, but he said he would send his aid to mark the house that it might be known. A moment after they got back, the aide, Mr. Biddle, I have his name to so many passes that I know it now, came to the door. Mr. Tunnard left him there, uncertain how we would receive a Christian, and I went out and asked him in. He looked uncertain of his reception, too, when we put an end to his doubt by treating him as we invariably treat gentlemen who appear such. 
He behaved remarkably well under the trying circumstances, and insisted on a sentinel, for, he said, though they would respect the property, there were many bad characters among the soldiers who might attempt to rob it, and the sentinel would protect it. After a visit of ten minutes devoted exclusively to the affair, he arose and took his leave, leaving me under the impression that he was a gentleman wherever he came from, even if there were a few grammatical errors in the pass he wrote me yesterday. But thou that judgest another, dost thou sin? Well, now we say fly to Greenwell. Yes, and by to-night a most exaggerated account of the whole affair will be spread over the whole country, and we will be equally suspected by our own people. Those who spread useless falsehoods about us will gladly have a foundation for a monstrous one. Didn't Camp Moore ring with the story of our entertaining the Federal officers? Didn't they spread the report that Miriam danced with one to the tune of Yankee Doodle in the State House garden? What will they stop at now? Oh, if only I was a man and knew what to do! Night we were so distressed by the false position in which we would be placed by a federal sentinel that we did not know what course to pursue. As all our friends shook their heads and said it was dangerous, we knew full well what our enemies would say. If we win Baton Rouge, as I pray we will, they will say we asked protection from Yankees against our own men, are consequently traitors, and our property will be confiscated by our own government." To decline General Williams's kind offer exposes the house to being plundered. In our dilemma, we made up our minds to stay, so we could say the sentinel was unnecessary. Presently a file of six soldiers marched to the gate. An officer came to the steps and introduced himself as Colonel McMillan of 21st Indiana Volunteers. He asked if this was Mrs. Morgan's. The general had ordered a guard placed around the house. He would suggest placing them in different parts of the yard. Madam, the pickets await your orders. Miriam, in a desperate fright, undertook to speak for mother, and asked if he thought there was any necessity. No, but it was an additional security, he said. Then, if no actual necessity, we will relieve you of the disagreeable duty, as we expect to remain in town, she said. He was very kind and discussed the whole affair with us, saying when we made up our minds to leave, we told him after we could not decide, to write him word and he would place a guard around to prevent his men and the negroes from breaking in. It was a singular situation, our brothers off fighting them, while these federal officers leaned over our fence and an officer standing on our steps offered to protect us. These people are certainly very kind to us. General Williams especially must be a dear old gentleman. He is so good. How many good and how many mean people these troubles have shown us! I am beginning to see my true friends now. There is a large number of them, too. Everybody from whom we least expected attention has agreeably surprised us. General Williams will believe we are insane from our changing so often. His guard positively refused. June 5th. Last night I determined to stay. Miriam went after our trunks at daylight. A few hours after, Lily wrote we must go back. McClellan's army was cut to pieces and driven back to Maryland by Jackson. The Federals were being driven into the swamp from Richmond, too. Beauregard is undoubtedly coming to attack Baton Rouge. His fire would burn the town if the gunboats do not. The Yankees will shell at all events if forced to retire. It cannot stand. We can't go to New Orleans. Butler says he will lay it in ashes if he is forced to evacuate it from yellow fever or other causes. Both must be burned. Greenwell is not worth the powder it would cost, so we must stand the chance of murder and starvation there, rather than the certainty of being placed between two fires here. Well, I see nothing but bloodshed and beggary staring us in the face. Let it come. I hope to die shouting, The Lord will provide. June 6th. 
We dined at Mrs. Bruno's yesterday, and sitting on the gallery later had the full benefit of a Yankee drill. They stopped in front of the house and went through some very curious maneuvers, and then marched out to their drill ground beyond. In returning, the whole regiment drew up directly before us, and we were dreadfully quiet for five minutes, the most uncomfortable I have experienced for some time. For it was absurd to look at the sky, and I looked in vain for one man with downcast eyes whereon I might rest mine, but from the officers down to the last private they were all looking at us. I believe I would have cried with embarrassment if the command had not been given at that moment. They drilled splendidly, and knew it too, so went through it as though they had not been at it for an hour before. One conceited, red-headed lieutenant smiled at us in the most fascinating way. Perhaps he smiled to think how fine he was, and what an impression he was making." We got back to our solitary house before twilight, and were sitting on the balcony when Mr. Biddle entered. He came to ask if the guard had been placed here last night. It seems to me it would have saved him such a long walk if he had asked Colonel Macmillan. He sat down, though, and got talking in the moonlight, and people passing, some citizens, some officers, looked wonderingly at this unheard-of occurrence. I won't be rude to any one in my own house, Yankee or Southern, say what they will. He talked a great deal and was very entertaining. What tempted him I cannot imagine. It was two hours before he thought of leaving. He was certainly very kind. He spoke of the scarcity of flour in town, said they had quantities at the garrison, and asked permission to send us a barrel, which of course we refused. It showed a very good heart, though. He offered to take charge of any letters I would write, said he had heard General Williams speak of Harry, and when he at last left I was still more pleased with him for his kindness to us. He says Captain Huger is dead. I am very, very much distressed. They are related, he says. He talks so reasonably of the war that it was quite a novelty after reading the abusive newspapers of both sides. I like him, and was sorry I could not ask him to repeat his visit. We are unaccustomed to treat gentlemen that way, but it won't do in the present state to act as we please. Mob governs. Mother kept me awake all night to listen to the mice in the garret, Every time I would doze, she would ask, What's that? and insist that the mice were men. I had to get up and look for an imaginary host, so I am tired enough this morning. Miriam has just got in with all the servants. Our baggage is on the way, so we will be obliged to stay whether we will or no. I don't care. It is all the same, starve or burn. Oh, I forgot. Mr. Biddle did not write that pass. It was his clerk. He speaks very grammatically, so far as I can judge. June 8th, Sunday. These people mean to kill us with kindness. There is such a thing as being too kind. Yesterday General Williams sent a barrel of flour to Mother, accompanied by a note begging her to accept it, in consideration of the present condition of the circulating currency. And the intention was so kind, the way it was done so delicate, that there was no refusing it. I had to write her thanks, and got in a violent fit of the trembles at the idea of writing to a stranger. One consolation is that I am not a very big fool, for it took only three lines to prove myself one. If I had been a thundering big one, I would have occupied two pages to show myself fully. And to think it is out of our power to prove them our appreciation of the kindness we have universally met with. Many officers were in church this morning, and as they passed us while we waited for the door to be opened, General Williams bowed profoundly. Another followed his example. We returned the salute, of course, but by to-morrow those he did not bow to will cry treason against us. Let them howl. I am tired of lies, scandal, and deceit. 
All the loudest gossips have been frightened into the country, but enough remain to keep them well supplied with town talk. It is such a consolation to turn to the dear good people of the world after coming in contact with such cattle. Here, for instance, is Mr. Boncase, on whom we have not the slightest claims. Every day since we have been here he has sent a great pitcher of milk, knowing our cow is out. One day he sent rice, the next sardines, yesterday two bottles of port and Madeira, which cannot be purchased in the whole South. What a duck of an old man! That is only one instance. June 10th. This morning, while I was attending to my flowers, several soldiers stopped in front of me, and holding on the fence, commenced to talk about some brave colonel and a shooting affair last night. When all had gone except one who was watching me attentively, as he seemed to wish to tell me, I let him go ahead. The story was that Colonel McMillan was shot through the shoulder, breast, and liver by three guerrillas while four miles from town last night on a scout. He was a quarter of a mile from his own men at the time, killed one who shot him, took the other two prisoners, and fell from his horse himself when he got within the lines. The soldier said these two guerrillas would probably be hanged, while the six we saw pass captives Sunday would probably be sent to Fort Jackson for life. I think the guerrilla affair mere murder, I confess, but what a dreadful fate for these young men. One who passed Sunday was Jimmy's schoolmate, a boy of sixteen. Another, Willie Garrig, the pet of a whole family of good honest country people. These soldiers will get in the habit of talking to me after a while through my own fault. Yesterday I could not resist the temptation to ask the fate of the six guerrillas, and stopped two volunteers who were going by to ask them. They discussed the fate of the country, told me Fort Pillow and Vicksburg were evacuated, the Mississippi opened from source to mouth. I told them of Banks's and McClellan's defeat. They assured me it would all be over in a month, which I fervently pray may be so. Told me they were from Michigan, one was Mr. B., he said, cousin of our general, and they would probably have talked all day if I had not bowed myself away with thanks for their information. It made me ashamed to contrast the quiet, gentlemanly, liberal way these volunteers spoke of us and our cause, with the rabid, fanatical, abusive violence of our own female secession declaimers. Thank heaven I have never yet made my appearance as a Billingsgate orator on these occasions. All my violent feelings, which in moments of intense excitement were really violent, I have recorded in this book. I am happy to say only the reasonable dislike to seeing my country subjugated has been confided to the public ear when necessary, and that even now I confess that nothing but the reign of terror and gross prejudice by which I was surrounded at that time could justify many expressions I have here applied to them. Fact is, these people have disarmed me by their kindness. I expected to be in a crowd of ruffian soldiers who would think nothing of cutting your throat or doing anything they felt like, and I find among all these thousands not one who offers the slightest annoyance or disrespect. The former is the thing as it is believed by the whole country, the latter the true state of affairs. I admire foes who show so much consideration for our feelings. Contrast these with our volunteers from New Orleans, all gentlemen, who came to take the garrison from Major Haskins. Several of them passing our gate where we were standing with the Brunos, one exclaimed, What pretty girls! It was a stage aside that we were supposed not to hear. Yes, said another, beautiful, but they look as though they could be fast. Fast? And we were not even speaking! not even looking at them. Sophie and I were walking presently, and met half a dozen. We had to stop to let them pass the crossing. They did not think of making way for us. Number one sighed, such a sigh. 
number two followed and so on when they all sighed in chorus for our edification while we dared not raise our eyes from the ground that is the time i would have made use of a dagger two passed in a buggy and trusting to our not recognizing them from the rapidity of their vehicle kissed their hands to us until they were out of sight all went back to new orleans vowing baton rouge had the prettiest girls in the world these were our own people the elite of new orleans loyal southerners and gentlemen these northerners pass us satisfied with a simple glance some take off their hats for all these officers know our name though we may not know theirs how i can't say when i heard of colonel mcmillan's misfortune mother conspired with me to send over some bandages and something tish manufactured of flour under the name of nourishment for he is across the street at harriman's miriam objected on account of what our people will say and what we will suffer for it if the guerrillas reach town but we persuaded her we were right you can imagine our condition at present many years hence sarah when you reflect that it is the brave noble-hearted generous miriam who is afraid to do that deed on account of public opinion which is indeed down on us at greenwell they are frantic about our returning to town and call us traitors yankees and vow vengeance a lady said to me the guerrillas have a blacklist containing the names of those remaining in town all the men are to be hanged their houses burned and all the women are to be tarred and feathered i said madam if i believed them capable of such a vile threat even much less the execution i would see them cut down without a feeling of compassion which is not true and swear i was a yankee rather than claim being a native of the same country with such brutes she has a long tongue when i next hear of it it will be that i told the story and called them brutes and hoped they would be shot etc and so goes the world no one will think of saying that i did not believe them guilty of the thought even our three brothers may be sick or wounded at this minute what i do for this man god will send some one to do for them and with that belief i do it june eleventh last evening mother and miriam went to the arsenal to see if they would be allowed to do anything for the prisoners general williams received them and fascinated miriam by his manner as usual poor miriam is always being fascinated according to her own account he sent for little nathan castle and willie garrig and left them alone in the room with them showing his confidence and delicacy by walking away the poor young men were very grateful to be remembered one had his eyes too full of tears to speak Mr. Garrig told Miriam that when the story of her refusing the escort was told in camp, the woods rang with shouts of, Three cheers for Miss Morgan. They said they were treated very well and had no want except clean clothes, and to let their mothers know they were well and content. I have been hard at work mending three or four suits of the boys' clothing for those poor young men some needed thread and needle very much but it was the best we could do so i packed them all up not forgetting a row of pins and sent tish off with the bundle perched real congo fashion on her many-coloured head handkerchief which was tied in the most superb creole style in honour of the occasion june sixteenth monday my poor old diary comes to a very abrupt end to my great distress the hardest thing in the world is to break off journalizing when you are once accustomed to it and mine has proved such a resource to me in these dark days of trouble that i feel as though i were saying good-bye to an old and tried friend thanks to my liberal supply of pens ink and paper how many inexpressibly dreary days i have filled up to my own satisfaction if not to that of others how many disagreeable affairs it has caused me to pass over without another thought how many times it has proved a relief to me where my tongue was forced to remain quiet 
Without the blessed materials I would have fallen victim to despair and the blues long since, but they have kept my eyes fixed on better days a-coming, while slightly alluding to present woes, kept me from making a fool of myself many a day, acted as lightning-rod to my mental thunder, and have made me happy generally. For all of which I cry, Vive pen, ink, and paper, and add with regret, Adieu, my mental conductor, I fear this unchained lightning will strike somewhere in your absence. End of Book One, Part Six Part One of A Confederate Girl's Diary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson Book Two, Part One, June Sixteenth to June Twenty Sixth, 1862 Monday, June Sixteenth, 1862. There is no use in trying to break off journalizing, particularly in these trying times. It has become a necessity to me. I believe I should go off in a rapid decline if Butler took it in his head to prohibit that, among other things. I reserve to myself the privilege of writing my opinions, since I trouble no one with the expression of them. I insist that if the valor and chivalry of our men cannot save our country, I would rather have it conquered by a brave race than owe its liberty to the Billingsgate oratory and demonstrations of some of these ladies. If the women have the upper hand then, as they have now, I would not like to live in a country governed by such tongues." Do I consider the female who could spit in a gentleman's face merely because he wore United States buttons as a fit associate for me? Lieutenant Biddle assured me he did not pass a street in New Orleans without being most grossly insulted by ladies. It was a friend of his into whose face a lady spit as he walked quietly by without looking at her. Wonder if she did it to attract his attention." He had the sense to apply to her husband and give him two minutes to apologize or die, and of course he chose the former. Such things are enough to disgust any one. Loud women, what a contempt I have for you! How I despise your vulgarity! Some of these ultra-secessionists, evidently very recently from down east, who think themselves obliged to kick up their heels over the bonny blue flag, as Brother describes female patriotism, shriek out, What, see those vile northerners pass patiently! No true southerner could see it without rage. I could kill them. I hate them with all my soul, the murderers, liars, thieves, rascals. You are no southerner if you do not hate them as much as I. Ah, sa. A true blue Yankee tell me that I, born and bred here, am no Southerner. I always think, it is well for you, my friend, to save your credit, else you might be suspected by some people, though your violence is enough for me. I always say, you may do as you please, my brothers are fighting for me and doing their duty, so that excess of patriotism is unnecessary for me, as my position is too well known to make any demonstrations requisite. This war has brought out wicked, malignant feelings that I did not believe could dwell in woman's heart. I see some of the holiest eyes, so holy one would think the very spirit of charity lived in them, and all Christian meekness, go off in a mad tirade of abuse and say, with the holy eyes wondrously changed, I hope God will send down plague, yellow fever, famine on these vile Yankees, and that not one will escape death. Oh, what unutterable horror that remark causes me as often as I hear it! I think of the many mothers, wives, and sisters who wait as anxiously, pray as fervently in their faraway homes for their dear ones, as we do here. 
I fancy them waiting day after day for the footsteps that will never come, growing more sad, lonely, and heartbroken as the days wear on. I think of how awful it would be if one would say, Your brothers are dead, how it would crush all life and happiness out of me, and I say, God forgive these poor women, they know not what they say. O oh, women, into what loathsome violence you have abased your holy mission! God will punish us for our hard-heartedness. Not a square off in the new theatre lie more than a hundred sick soldiers. What woman has stretched out her hand to save them, to give them a cup of cold water? Where is the charity which should ignore nations and creeds, and administer help to the Indian and heathen indifferently? Gone! all gone in union versus secession. That is what the American war has brought us. If I was independent, if I could work my own will without causing others to suffer for my deeds, I would not be poring over this stupid page. I would not be idly reading or sewing. I would put aside woman's trash, take up woman's duty, and I would stand by some forsaken man and bid him Godspeed as he closes his dying eyes. That is woman's mission, and not preaching and politics. I say I would, yet here I sit. Oh, for liberty, the liberty that dares do what conscience dictates, and scorns all smaller rules. If I could help these dying men— yet it is as impossible as though I was a chained bear. I can't put out my hand. I am threatened with Coventry because I sent a custard to a sick man who is in the army, and with the anathema of society, because I said if I could possibly do anything for Mr. Biddle, at a distance, he is sick, I would like to very much. Charlie thinks we have acted shockingly in helping Colonel McMillan, and that we will suffer for it when the Federals leave. I would like to see any man who dared harm my father's daughter. But as he seems to think our conduct reflects on him, there is no alternative. Die, poor men, without a woman's hand to close your eyes. We women are too patriotic to help you. I look eagerly on, cry in my soul, I wish you die. God judges me. Behold the woman who dares not risk private ties for God's glory and her professed religion. Coward, helpless woman that I am! If I was free! June 17th. Yesterday and day before, boats were constantly arriving and troops embarking from here destined for Vicksburg. There will be another fight, and of course it will fall. I wish Will was out of it. I don't want him to die. I got the kindest, sweetest letter from Will when Miriam came from Greenwell. It was given to her by a gorilla on the road who asked if she was not Miss Sarah Morgan. June 18th. How long, oh, how long is it since I have lain down in peace, thinking, this night I will rest in safety? Certainly not since the fall of Fort Jackson— if left to myself I would not anticipate evil, but would quietly await the issue of all these dreadful events. But when I hear men, who certainly should know better than I, express their belief that in twenty-four hours the town will be laid in ashes, I begin to grow uneasy and think it must be so, since they say it. These last few days, since the news arrived of the intervention of the English and French, I have alternately risen and fallen from the depth of despair to the height of delight and expectation, as the probability of another exodus diminishes and peace appears more probable. If these men would not prophesy the burning of the city, I would be perfectly satisfied." Well, I packed up a few articles to satisfy my conscience, since these men insist that another run is inevitable, though against my own conviction. I am afraid I was partly influenced by my dream last night of being shelled out unexpectedly and flying without saving an article. 
It was the same dream I had a night or two before we fled so ingloriously from Baton Rouge, when I dreamed of meeting Will Pinckney suddenly, who greeted me in the most extraordinarily affectionate manner, and told me that Vicksburg had fallen. He said he had been chiefly to blame, and the Southerners were so incensed at his losing, the Northerners at his defending, that both were determined to hang him. He was running for his life. He took me to a hill from which I could see the garrison and the American flag flying over it. I looked and saw we were standing in blood up to our knees, while here and there ghastly white bones shone above the red surface. Just then, below me, I saw crowds of people running. "'What is it?' I asked. "'It means that in another instant they will commence to shell the town. Save yourself.' "'But, Will, I must save some clothes, too. How can I go among strangers with a single dress? I will get some,' I cried. He smiled and said, "'You will run with only what articles you happen to have on.' Bang! went the first shell. The people rushed by with screams, and I awakened to tell Miriam what an absurd dream I had had. It happened, as Will had said, either that same day or the day after, for the change of clothes we saved a piece were given to Tish, who lost sight of us and quietly came home when all was over, and the two dirty skirts and old cloak mother saved, after carrying them a mile and a half, I put in the buggy that took her up, so I saved nothing except the bag that was tied under my hoops. Will was right. I saved not even my powder bag. Tish had it in the bundle. My handkerchief I gave mother before we had walked three squares, and throughout that long, fearfully warm day, riding and walking through the fiery sunshine and stifling dust, I had neither to cool or comfort me. June 19th Miriam and I have disgraced ourselves— This morning I was quietly hearing Delly's lessons, when I was startled by Mother's shrieks of, "'Send for a guard! They've murdered him!' I saw through the window a soldier sitting in the road just opposite, with blood streaming from his hand in a great pool in the dust. I was downstairs in three bounds, and snatching up some water, ran to where he sat alone, not a creature near, though all the inhabitants of our side of the street were looking on from the balconies, all crying, Murder and help, without moving themselves. I poured some water on the man's bloody hand as he held it streaming with gore up to me, saying, The man in there did it, meaning the one who keeps the little grog shop, though it puzzled me at the time to see that all the doors were closed and not a face visible. I had hardly time to speak when Tish called loudly to me to come away. She was safe at the front gate, and looking up I found myself in a knot of a dozen soldiers and took her advice and retreated home. It proved to be the guard Miriam had roused. She ran out as I did, and, seeing a gentleman, begged him to call the guard for that murdered man. The individual, he must have been a patriot, said he didn't know where to find one. She cried out they were at Harriman's. He said he didn't believe they were. "'Go, I tell you,' she screamed at last." but the brave man said he didn't like to, so she ran to the corner and called the soldiers herself. Oh, most brave man! Before we got back from our several expeditions, we heard Mother, Lily, Mrs. Day, all shouting, Bring in the children, lock the doors, etc., all for a poor wounded soldier. We after discovered that the man was drunk and had cursed the woman of the grog shop, whereupon her husband had pitched him out in the street where they found him. They say he hurt his hand against a post, but Wood could never have cut deep enough to shed all that gore. I don't care if he was drunk or sober, soldier or officer, Federal or Confederate. If he had been Satan himself, lying helpless and bleeding in the street, I would have gone to him. I can't believe it was as criminal as though I had watched quietly from a distance, believing him dying and contenting myself with looking on. Yet it seems it was dreadfully indecorous. 
Miriam and I did very wrong. We should have shouted murder with the rest of the women and servants, whereas the man who declined committing himself by calling one soldier to the rescue of another, supposed to be dying, acted most discreetly, and showed his wisdom in the most striking manner. May I never be discreet or wise if this is Christian conduct or a sample of either. I would rather be a rash, impetuous fool. Charlie says he would not open his mouth to save a dozen from being murdered. I say I am not stoic enough for that. Lily agrees with him, Miriam with me. So here we two culprits stand alone before the tribunal of patriotism. Madame Roland, I take the liberty of altering your words and cry, O oh, patriotism, how many base deeds are sanctioned by your name! Don't I wish I was a heathen! In twenty-four hours the whole country will be down on us. O oh, for a pen to paint the slaves, whose country, like a deadly blight, closes all hearts when pity craves, and turns God's spirit to darkest night. May life's patriotic cup for such be filled with glory overmuch, and when their spirits go above in pride, spirit of patriotism, let these valiant abide full in the sight of grand mass meeting. I don't want you to cuss them, but put them where they can hear politics and yet can't discuss them. I can't say worse than that. June 26. Yesterday morning, just as I stepped out of bed, I heard the report of four cannon fired in rapid succession, and everybody asked everybody else, Did you hear that? So significantly, that I must say my heart beat very rapidly for a few moments at the thought of another stampede. At half-past six this morning I was awakened by another report, followed by seven others, and heard again the question, Did you hear that? on a higher key than yesterday. It did not take me many minutes to get out of bed and to slip on a few articles, I confess. My chief desire was to wash my face before running, if they were actually shelling us again. It appears that they were only practicing, however, and no harm was intended. But we are living on such a volcano that not knowing what to expect we are rather nervous." I am afraid this close confinement will prove too much for me. My long walks are cut off on account of the soldiers. One month to-morrow since my last visit to the graveyard. That haunts me always. It must be so dreary out there. Here is a sketch of my daily life, enough to finish me off forever if much longer persisted in. First, get up a little before seven. After breakfast, which is generally within a few minutes after I get down, it used to be just as I got ready, and sometimes before, last winter, I attend to my garden, which consists of two strips of ground the length of the house in front, where I can find an hour's work in examining and admiring my flowers, replanting those that the cows and horses occasionally, once a day, pull up for me, and in turning the soil over and over again to see which side grows best. Oh, my garden, abode of rare delights! How many pleasant hours I have passed in you, armed with scissors, knife, hoe, or rake, only pausing when Mr. This or Mr. That leaned over the fence to have a talk. Last spring, that was. Ever so many are dead now, for all I know, and all off at the war. Now I work for the edification of proper young women, who look in astonishment at me, as they would consider themselves degraded by the pursuit. A delicate pair of hands my flower-mania will leave me. Then I hear Delly's and Morgan's lessons, after which I open my desk and am lost in the mysteries of arithmetic, geography, Blair's lectures, Noël et Chaspal, Ollendorf, and reading aloud in French and English, besides writing occasionally in each, and sometimes a peep at La Voine, until very nearly dinner. The day is not half long enough for me. Many things I would like to study I am forced to give up for want of leisure to devote to them. But one of these days I will make up for present deficiencies.' 
I study only what I absolutely love now, but then, if I can, I will study what I am at present ignorant of, and cultivate a taste for something new. The few moments before dinner, and all the time after, I devote to writing, sewing, knitting, etc., and if I included darning, repairs, alterations, etc., my list would be tremendous, for I get through with a great deal of sewing. Somewhere in the day I find half an hour or more to spend at the piano. Before sunset I dress, and am free to spend the evening at home, or else walk to Mrs. Bruno's, for it is not safe to go farther than those three squares away from home. From early twilight until supper, Miriam and I sing with the guitar, generally, and after sit comfortably under the chandelier and read until about ten. What little reading I do is almost exclusively done at that time. It sounds woefully little, but my list of books grows to quite a respectable size in the course of a year. At ten comes my Bible class for the servants. Lucy, Rose, Nancy, and Dophy assemble in my room and hear me read the Bible or stories from the Bible for a while. Then one by one say their prayers— they cannot be persuaded to say them together. Dophy says she can't say with Rose, cause she ain't got no brothers and sisters to pray for, and Lucy has no father or mother, and so they go. All difficulties and grievances during the day are laid before me, and I sit like Moses judging the children of Israel, until I can appease the discord. Sometimes it is not so easy. For instance, that memorable night when I had to work Rose's stubborn heart to a proper pitch of repentance for having stabbed a carving fork in Lucy's arm in a fit of temper. I don't know that I was ever as much astonished as I was at seeing the dogged, sullen girl throw herself on the floor in a burst of tears and say, if God would forgive her, she would never do it again. I was lashing myself internally for not being able to speak as I should, furious at myself for talking so weakly, and lo, here the girl tumbles over, wailing and weeping. And Dophy, overcome by her feelings, sobs, "'Lucy, I scratched you last week. Please forgive me this once.' And amazed and bewildered, I look at the touching tableau before me of kissing and reconciliation, for Lucy can bear malice toward no one, and is ready to forgive before others repent, and I look from one to the other, wondering what it was that upset them so completely, for certainly no words of mine caused it. Sometimes Lucy sings a wild hymn, Did you ever hear the heaven bells ring? Come, my loving brothers, when I put on my starry crown, etc., and after some such scene as just described, it is pleasant to hear them going out of the room saying, Good night, Miss Sarah, God bless Miss Sarah, and all that. End of Book Two, Part One Book Two, Part Two of A Confederate Girl's Diary this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Two, Part Two, June twenty seventh to July third, eighteen sixty two. June twenty seventh. A proclamation of Van Dorn has just been smuggled into town that advises all persons living within eight miles of the Mississippi to remove into the interior, as he is determined to defend his department at all hazards to the last extremity. Does not look like the piece I have been deluding myself with, does it? That means another exodus. How are we to leave when we are not allowed to pass the limits of the corporation by the Federals? where are we to go? We are between the two armies, and here we must remain, patiently awaiting the result. Some of these dark nights, bang, we will hear the cannon, and then it will be sauve qui peut in a shower of shells. Bah! 
I don't believe God will suffer that we should be murdered in such a dreadful way. I don't believe he will suffer us to be turned homeless and naked on the world. Something will turn up before we are attacked, and we will be spared, I am certain. We can't look forward for more than an hour at a time now, sometimes not a minute ahead, witness the shelling frolic, so I must resume my old habit of laying a clean dress on my bed before going to sleep, which I did every night for six weeks before the shelling of Baton Rouge, in order to run respectably, as muslin crossbar nightgowns are not suitable for day dresses. June 28th. I am afraid I shall be nervous when the moment of the bombardment actually arrives. This suspense is not calculated to soothe one's nerves. A few moments since a salute was fired in honor of General Butler's arrival, when women, children, and servants rushed to the front of the houses, confident of a repetition of the shelling which occurred a month ago to-day. The children have not forgotten the scene, for they all actually howled with fear. Poor little Sarah stopped her screams to say, "'Mother, don't you wish we was dogs, dead of white folks?' in such piteous accents that we had to laugh. "'Don't I wish I was a dog? Sarah is right. I don't know if I showed my uneasiness a while ago, but certainly my heart has hardly yet ceased beating rather rapidly.' If I knew what moment to expect the stampede, I would not mind, but this way, to expect it every instant, it is too much. Again, if I knew where we could go for refuge from the shells. A window banging unexpectedly just then gave me a curious twinge, not that I thought it was the signal, oh dear no, I just thought, what, I wonder? Pshaw! Picayune Butler's coming, coming has upset my nervous system. He interrupted me in the middle of my arithmetic, and I have not the energy to resume my studies. I shall try what effect an hour's practice will have on my spirits, and will see that I have a pair of clean stockings in my stampede sack, and that the fastenings of my running bag are safe though if I expect to take either I should keep in harness constantly. How long, O oh Lord, how long? June twenty-ninth, Sunday. Any more, Mr. Lincoln, any more? Can't you leave our racked homes in repose? We are all wild. Last night five citizens were arrested on no charge at all, and carried down to Picayune Butler's ship. What a thrill of terror ran through the whole community! We all felt so helpless, so powerless under the hand of our tyrant, the man who swore to uphold the Constitution and the laws, who was professedly only fighting to give us all liberty, the birthright of every American, and who nevertheless has ground us down to a state where we would not reduce our Negroes, who tortures and sneers at us, and rules us with an iron hand. Ah, liberty, what a humbug! I would rather belong to England or France than to the North. Bondage, woman that I am, I can never stand. Even now the Northern papers, distributed among us, taunt us with our subjection, and tell us how coolly Butler will grind them down, paying no regard to their writhing and torture beyond tightening the bonds still more. Ah, truly, this is the bitterness of slavery, to be insulted and reviled by cowards who are safe at home and enjoy the protection of the laws, while we, captive and overpowered, dare not raise our voices to throw back the insult, and are governed by the despotism of one man, whose word is our law. And that man, they tell us, is the right man in the right place. He will develop a union sentiment among the people if the thing can be done. Come and see if he can. Hear the curse that arises from thousands of hearts at that man's name, and say if he will speedily bring us to our senses. Will he accomplish it by love, tenderness, mercy, compassion? He might have done it, but did he try? When he came, he assumed his natural role as tyrant, and bravely has he acted it through, never once turning aside for justice or mercy. 
This degradation is worse than the bitterness of death. I see no salvation on either side. No glory awaits the Southern Confederacy, even if it does achieve its independence. It will be a mere speck in the world, with no weight or authority. The North confesses itself lost without us, and has paid an unheard-of ransom to regain us. On the other hand, conquered, what hope is there in this world for us? Broken in health and fortune, reviled, contemned, abused by those who claim already to have subdued us, without a prospect of future support for those few of our brothers who return. Outcasts without home or honor, would not death or exile be preferable? Oh, let us abandon our loved home to these implacable enemies and find refuge elsewhere. Take from us property, everything, only grant us liberty. Is this rather frantic, considering I abhor politics and women who meddle with them above all? My opinion has not yet changed. I still feel the same contempt for a woman who would talk at the top of her voice for the edification of federal officers, as though anxious to receive an invitation requesting her presence at the garrison. I can suffer and be still as far as outward signs are concerned, but as no word of this has passed my lips I give it vent in writing, which is more lasting than words, partly to relieve my heart, partly to prove to my own satisfaction that I am no coward. For one line of this, surrounded as we are by soldiers, and liable to have our houses searched at any instant, would be a sufficient indictment for high treason. Under General Williams's rule I was perfectly satisfied that whatever was done was done through necessity, and under orders from headquarters, beyond his control. We all liked him. But now, since Butler's arrival, I believe I am as frantic in secret as the others are openly. I know that war sanctions many hard things, and that both sides practice them. But now we are so completely lost in Louisiana, is it fair to jibe and taunt us with our humiliation? I could stand anything save the cowardly ridicule and triumph of their papers. Honestly, I believe if all vile abusive papers on both sides were suppressed, and some of the fire-eating editors who make a living by lying were soundly cowhided or had their ears clipped, it would do more towards establishing peace than all the bloodshedding either side can afford. I hope to live to see it, too. Seems to me more liberty is allowed to the press than would be tolerated in speech. Let us speak as freely as any paper, and see if to-morrow we do not sleep at Fort Jackson. This morning the excitement is rare. Fifteen more citizens were arrested and carried off, and all the rest grew wild with expectation. So great a martyrdom is it considered that I am sure those who are not arrested will be woefully disappointed. It is ludicrous to see how each man thinks he is the very one they are in search of. We asked a twopenny lawyer of no more importance in the community than Dophy is if it was possible he was not arrested. But I am expecting to be every instant. So much for his self-assurance. Those arrested have, some, been quietly released. Those are so smiling and mysterious that I suspect them. Some been obliged to take the oath. Some sent to Fort Jackson." Ah, Liberty, what a blessing it is to enjoy thy privileges! If some of these poor men are not taken prisoners, they will die of mortification at the slight. Our valiant governor, the brave Moore, has by order of the real governor, Moise, made himself visible at some far distant point, and issued a proclamation saying, whereas we of Baton Rouge were held forcibly in town, he therefore considered men, women, and children prisoners of war, and as such the Yankees are bound to supply us with all necessaries, and consequently any one sending us aid or comfort or provisions from the country will be severely punished. Only Moore is fool enough for such an order. Held down by the Federals, 
our paper money so much trash, with hardly any other to buy food and no way of earning it, threatened with starvation and utter ruin, our own friends, by way of making our burden lighter, forbid our receiving the means of prolonging life, and after generously warning us to leave town, which they know is perfectly impossible, prepare to burn it over our heads, and let the women run the same risk as the men. Penned in on one little square mile, here we await our fate like sheep in the slaughter-pen. Our hour may be at hand now, it may be to-night. We have only to wait. The booming of the cannon will announce it to us soon enough. Of the six sentenced to Fort Jackson, one is the Methodist minister, Mr. Craven. The only charge is that he was heard to pray for the Confederate States by some officers who passed his house during family prayers. According to that, which of us would escape unhung? I do not believe there is a woman in the land who closes her eyes before praying for God's blessing on the side on which her brothers are engaged. Are we all to cease? Show me the dungeon deep enough to keep me from praying for them. The man represented that he had a large family totally dependent on him, who must starve. "'Let them get up a subscription,' was General Butler's humane answer. "'I will head it myself.' "'It is useless to say the generous offer was declined.'" June 30th. As a specimen of the humanity of General Butler, let me record a threat of his, uttered with all the force and meaning language can convey, and certainly enough to strike terror in the hearts of frail women, since all these men believe him fully equal to carry it into execution. Some even believe it will be done. In speaking to Mr. Solomon Benjamin of foreign intervention in our favor, he said, let England or France try it, and I'll be blank if I don't arm every negro in the South and make them cut the throat of every man, woman, and child in it. I'll make them lay the whole country waste with fire and sword and leave it desolate. Draw me a finer picture of coward, brute, or bully than that one sentence portrays. O oh, men of the North, you do your noble hearts wrong in sending such ruffians among us as representatives of a great people. Was ever a more brutal thought uttered in a more brutal way? Mother, like many another, is crazy to go away from here, even to New Orleans, but like the rest will be obliged to stand and await her fate. I don't believe Butler would dare execute his threat, for at the first attempt, thousands who are passive now would cut the brutal heart from his inhuman breast tuesday july first i heard such a good joke last night if i had belonged to the female declaiming club i fear me i would have resigned instantly through mere terror thank heaven i don't these officers say the women talk too much which is undeniable they then said they meant to get up a sewing society and place in it every woman who makes herself conspicuous by her loud talking about them. Fancy what a refinement of torture! But only a few would suffer. The majority would be only too happy to enjoy the usual privilege of sewing societies, slander, abuse, and insinuations. How some would revel in it! The mere threat makes me quake. If I could so far forget my dignity and my father's name as to court the notice of gentlemen by contemptible insult, etc., and if I should be ordered to take my seat at the sewing society, I would never hold my head up again. Member of a select sewing circle. Fancy me. I know there is never any gossip in our society, though the one over the way gets up dreadful reports. I have heard all that, but would rather try neither. Oh, how I would beg and plead! Fifty years at Fort Jackson, good kind General Butler, rather than half an hour in your sewing society. Gentle, humane ruler, spare me, and I split my throat in shouting Yankee Doodle and Hurrah for Lincoln. Any, 
"'Everything, so I am not disgraced. "'Deliver me from your sewing society, "'and I'll say and do what you please.' Butler told some of these gentlemen that he had a detective watching almost every house in town, and he knew everything. True or not, it looks suspicious. We are certainly watched. Every evening two men may be seen in the shadow on the other side of the street, standing there until ever so late, sometimes until after we have gone to bed. It may be that, far from home, they are attracted by the bright light and singing, and watch us for their amusement. A few nights ago so many officers passed and repassed while we were singing on the balcony, that I felt as though our habit of long-standing had suddenly become improper. Saturday night, having secured a paper, we were all crowding around, "'Lily and I reading every now and then a piece of news from opposite ends of the paper. "'Charlie, walking on the balcony, found five officers leaning over the fence "'watching us as we stood under the light through the open window. "'Hope they won't elect me to the sewing society. "'Thursday night, July 3rd. Another day of sickening suspense.' This evening, about three, came the rumor that there was to be an attack on the town tonight, or early in the morning, and we had best be prepared for anything. I can't say I believe it, but in spite of my distrust I made my preparations. First of all I made a charming improvement in my knapsack, alias pillowcase, by sewing a strong black band down each side of the center from the bottom to the top, when it is carried back and fastened below again, allowing me to pass my arms through, and thus present the appearance of an old peddler. Miriam's I secured also, and tied all our laces in a handkerchief ready to lay it in the last thing. But the interior of my bag, what a medley it is! First, I believe, I have secured four underskirts, three chemises, as many pairs of stockings, two underbodies, the prayer-book father gave me, Tennyson that Harry gave me when I was fourteen, two unmade muslins, a white mull, English grenadine trimmed with lilac, and a purple linen and nightgown. Then I must have Lavinia's daguerreotype, and how could I leave Will's when perhaps he was dead? Besides, Howells and Will Carter's were with him, and one single case did not matter. But there was Tom Barker's I would like to keep, and, oh, let's take Mr. Stone's. And I can't slight Mr. Dunnington, for these two have been too kind to Jimmy for me to forget. "'and poor Captain Huger is dead, and I will keep his, "'so they all went together. "'A box of pens, too, was indispensable, "'and a case of French note-paper "'and a bundle of Harry's letters were added. "'Miriam insisted on the old diary that preceded this "'and found place for it, "'though I am afraid if she knew what trash she was to carry "'she would retract before going farther.' It makes me heartsick to see the utter ruin we will be plunged in if forced to run to-night. Not a hundredth part of what I most value can be saved, if I counted my letters and papers not a thousandth. But I cannot believe we will run to-night. The soldiers tell whoever questions them that there will be a fight before morning, but I believe it must be to alarm them. Though what looks suspicious is that the officers said— to whom is not stated, that the ladies must not be uneasy if they heard cannon to-night, as they would probably commence to celebrate the Fourth of July about twelve o'clock. What does it mean? I repeat I don't believe a word of it, yet I have not yet met the woman or child who is not prepared to fly. Rose knocked at the door just now to show me her preparations— her only thought seems to be mother's silver, so she has quietly taken possession of our shoe-bag, which is a long sack for odds and ends with cases for shoes outside, and has filled it with all the contents of the silver-box. This hung over her arm, and carrying Louis and Sarah, this young Samson says she will be ready to fly. 
I don't believe it, yet here I sit, my knapsack serving me for a desk, my seat the chair on which I have carefully spread my clothes in order. At my elbow lies my running or treasure bag, surrounded by my kaba, filled with hairpins, starch, and a band I was embroidering, etc. Near it lie our combs, etc., and the whole is crowned by my dagger. By the way, I must add Miriam's pistol, which she has forgotten, though over there lies her knapsack ready, too, with our bonnets and veils. It is long past eleven, and no sound of the cannon. Bah! I do not expect it. I'll lay me down and sleep in peace, for thou only, Lord, makest me to dwell in safety. Good night. I wake up to-morrow the same as usual, and be disappointed that my trouble was unnecessary. End of Book Two, Part Two Two, part three of a confederate girl's diary this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a confederate girl's diary by sarah morgan dawson book 2 part 3 july 4th to july 8th 1862 July 4th. Here I am, and still alive, having wakened but once in the night, and that only in consequence of Louis and Morgan crying, nothing more alarming than that. I ought to feel foolish, but I do not. I am glad I was prepared, even though there was no occasion for it. While I was taking my early bath, Lily came to the bathhouse and told me through the weather-boarding of another battle. "'Stonewall Jackson has surrounded McClellan completely, and victory is again ours. "'This is said to be the sixth battle he has fought in twenty days, and they say he has won them all. "'And the Seventh Regiment distinguished itself, and was presented with four cannon on the battlefield "'in acknowledgment of its gallant conduct. "'Gibbs belongs to the ragged, howling regiment that rushed on the field yelling like unchained devils, and spread a panic through the army, as the northern papers said, describing the Battle of Manassas. Oh, how I hope he has escaped! And they say, Palmerston has urged the recognition of the Confederacy and an armed intervention on our side. Would it not be glorious?' Oh, for peace, blessed peace, and our brothers once more. Palmerston is said to have painted Butler as the vilest oppressor, and having added he was ashamed to acknowledge him of Anglo-Saxon origin. Perhaps knowing the opinion entertained of him by foreign nations caused Butler to turn such a somersault, for a few days before his arrival here we saw a leading article in the leading union paper of new orleans threatening us with the arming of the slaves for our extermination if england interfered in the same language almost as butler used when here three days ago the same paper ridiculed the idea and said such a brutal inhuman thing was never for a moment thought of it was too absurd and so the world goes we all turn somersaults occasionally. And yet I would rather we would achieve our independence alone, if possible. It would be so much more glorious. And then I would hate to see England conquer the North, even if for our sake. My love for the old Union is still too great to be willing to see it humiliated. If England would just make Lincoln come to his senses, and put an end to all this confiscation which is sweeping over everything, make him agree to let us alone and behave himself, that will be quite enough. But what a task! If it were put to the vote to-morrow to return free and unmolested to the Union or stay out, I am sure Union would have the majority— but this way, to think we are to be sent to Fort Jackson and all the other prisons for expressing our ideas, however harmless, to have our houses burned over our heads, and all the prominent men hanged, who would be eager for it? Unless, indeed, it was to escape even the greater horrors of a war of extermination. July 5th. 
think that since the twenty-eighth of may i have not walked three squares at a time for my only walks are to mrs bruno's it is enough to kill any one i might as well be at ship island where butler has sentenced mrs philip for laughing while the corpse of a federal officer was passing at least that is to be the principal charge though i hope for the sake of butler's soul that he had better reasons shocking as her conduct was she hardly deserved two years close confinement in such a dreadful place as that because she happened to have no sense of delicacy and no feeling the darkest hour is just before the day we have had the blackest night for almost three months and i don't see the light yet better days are coming i am getting sceptical i fear me I look forward to my future life with a shudder. This one cannot last long. I will be up and doing before many months are past. Doing what? Why, if all father left us is lost forever, if we are to be penniless as well as homeless, I'll work for my living. How, I wonder? I will teach. I know I am not capable, but I can do my best. I would rather die than be dependent. I would rather die than teach. There now, you know how I feel. Teaching before dependence, death before teaching. My soul revolts from the drudgery. I never see a governess that my heart does not ache for her. I think of the nameless, numberless insults and trials she is forced to submit to, of the hopeless, thankless task that is imposed on her, to which she is expected to submit without a murmur of all her griefs and agony shut up in her heart, and I cry heaven help a governess. My heart bleeds for them, and... One o'clock p.m. Thus far had I reached when news came that our forces were attacking the town and had already driven the pickets in. I am well now. We all rushed to make preparations instantly. I had just finished washing my hair before I commenced writing, and had it all streaming around me, but it did not take a minute to thrust it into a loose net. Then we each put on a fresh dress except myself, as I preferred to have a linen cambric worn several times before to a clean one not quite so nice, for that can do good service when washed. The excitement is intense. Mother is securing a few of father's most valuable papers, Lily running around after the children, and waiting for Charlie, who cannot be found. Miriam, after securing all things needful, has gone downstairs to wait the issue, and I, dressed for instant flight with my running bag tied to my waist and knapsack, bonnet, veil, etc., on the bed, occupy my last few moments at home in this profitable way. Nobody knows what it is. A regiment has been marched out to meet our troops, some say commanded by Van Dorn, which I doubt. The gunboats are preparing to second them. We hear the garrison drum and see people running, that is all. We don't know what is coming. I believe it will prove nothing after all. But the gunboat is drawn up so as to command our street here the guns aimed up the street just below and if a house falls ours will be about the first well this time next year we will know all of which we are now ignorant that is one consolation the house will either be down or standing then six p m we have once more subsided how foolish all this seems Miriam and I laughed while preparing, and laughed while unpacking. It is the only way to take such things, and we agree on that, as on most other subjects. They say the affair originated from half a dozen shots fired by some Federal soldiers through idleness, whereupon the pickets rushed in screaming Van Dorn was after them at the head of six thousand men. I have my reasons for doubting the story. It must have been something more than that to spread such a panic, for they certainly had time to ascertain the truth of the attack before they beat the long roll and sent out their troops, for if it had been Van Dorn he would have been on them before that. Whatever it was, I am glad of the excitement, for it gave me new life for several hours. I was really sick before. Oh, this life! 
when will it end evermore and forevermore shall we live in this suspense i wish we were in the sandwich islands july seventh as we no longer have a minister mr gearlow having gone to europe and no papers i am in danger of forgetting the days of the week as well as those of the month but i am positive that yesterday was sunday because i heard the sunday school bells and friday i am sure was the fourth because i heard the national salute fired i must remember that to find my dates by well last night being sunday a son of captain hooper who died in the fort jackson fight having just come from new orleans stopped here on his way to jackson to tell us the news or rather to see charlie and told us afterwards he says a boat from mobile reached the city saturday evening and the captain told mr lenu that he brought an extra from the former place containing news of mcclellan's surrender with his entire army his being mortally wounded and the instant departure of a french and english man-of-war from hampton roads with the news that revived my spirits considerably all except mcclellan's being wounded i could dispense with that but if it were true and if peace would follow and the boys come home oh what bliss i would die of joy as rapidly as i am pining away with suspense now i am afraid about ten o'clock as we came up mother went to the window in the entry to tell the news to mrs day and while speaking saw a man creeping by under the window in the narrow little alley on the side of the house evidently listening for he had previously been standing in the shadow of a tree and left the street to be nearer when mother ran to give the alarm to charlie i looked down and there the man was looking up as i could dimly see for he crouched down in the shadow of the fence presently stooping still he ran fast towards the front of the house making quite a noise in the long tangled grass when he got near the pepper bush he drew himself up to his full height paused a moment as though listening and then walked quietly towards the front gate by that time Charlie reached the front gallery above and called to him, asking what he wanted. Without answering, the man walked steadily out, closed the gate deliberately, then, suddenly remembering drunkenness would be the best excuse, gave a lurch towards the house, walked off perfectly straight in the moonlight, until seeing Dr. Day fastening his gate, he reeled again. That man was not drunk drunken men cannot run crouching do not shut gates carefully after them would have no inclination to creep in a dim little alley merely to creep out again it may have been one of our detectives standing in the full moonlight which was very bright he certainly looked like a gentleman for he was dressed in a handsome suit of black he was no citizen form your own conclusions well after all he heard no treason let him play eavesdropper if he finds it consistent with his character as a gentleman. The captain who brought the extra from Mobile wished to have it reprinted, but it was instantly seized by a federal officer who carried it to Butler, who monopolized it, so that will never be heard of again. We must wait for other means of information. The young boy who told us reminds me very much of Jimmy, he is by no means so handsome, but yet there is something that recalls him, and his voice, though more childish, sounds like Jimmy's too. I had an opportunity of writing to Lydia by him, of which I gladly availed myself, and have just finished a really tremendous epistle. Wednesday, ninth July. Poor Miriam, poor Sarah, they are disgraced again last night we were all sitting on the balcony in the moonlight singing as usual with our guitar i have been so accustomed to hear father say in the evening come girls where is my concert and he took so much pleasure in listening that i could not think singing in the balcony so very dreadful since he encouraged us in it but last night changed all my ideas 
we noticed Federals, both officers and soldiers, pass singly, or by twos or threes at different times, but as we were not singing for their benefit, and they were evidently attending to their own affairs, there was no necessity of noticing them at all. But about half-past nine, after we had sung two or three dozen others, we commenced Mary of Argyle. As the last word died away, while the chords were still vibrating, came a sound of clapping hands, in short. Down went every string of the guitar. Charlie cried, I told you so, and ordered an immediate retreat. Miriam objected as undignified, but renounced the guitar. Mother sprang to her feet and closed the front windows in an instant, whereupon, dignified or not, we all evacuated the gallery and fell back into the house. All this was done in a few minutes, and as quietly as possible, and while the gas was being turned off downstairs, Miriam and I flew upstairs. I confess I was mortified to death, very, very much ashamed, but we wanted to see the guilty party, for from below they were invisible. We stole out on the front balcony above, and in front of the house that used to be Gibbs's we beheld one of the culprits. At the sight of the creature my mortification vanished in intense compassion for his. He was standing under the tree, half in the moonlight, his hands in his pockets, looking at the extinction of light below, with the true state of affairs dawning on his astonished mind, and looking by no means satisfied with himself such an abashed creature he looked just as though he had received a kick that conscious of deserving he dared not return while he yet gazed on the house in silent amazement and consternation hands still forlornly searching his pockets as though for a reason for our behaviour from under the dark shadows of the tree another slowly picked himself up from the ground hope he was not knocked down by surprise, and joined the first. His hand sought his pockets, too, and, if possible, he looked more mortified than the other. After looking for some time at the house, satisfied that they had put an end to future singing from the gallery, they walked slowly away, turning back every now and then to be certain that it was a fact. If ever I saw two mortified, hangdog-looking men, they were these two as they took their way home. Was it not shocking? But they could not have meant it merely to be insulting, or they would have placed themselves in full view of us rather than out of sight under the trees. Perhaps they were thinking of their own homes instead of us. July 10th a proclamation is out announcing that any one talking about the war or present state of affairs will be summarily dealt with. Now, seems to me summarily is not exactly the word they mean, but it still has an imposing effect. What a sad state their affairs must be in if they can't bear comment. An officer arrived day before yesterday, bringing the surprising intelligence that McClellan had captured Richmond and fifty thousand prisoners. That is the time they talked. But when we received yesterday confirmation of his being finally defeated by our troops, and the capture of his railroad train twelve miles in length, they forbid further mention of the subject. I wonder if they expect to be obeyed. What a stretch of tyranny! O oh, free America, you who uphold free people, free speech, free everything! What a foul blot of despotism rests on a once spotless name! A nation of brave men who wage war on women and lock them up in prisons for using their woman weapon, the tongue! A nation of free people who advocate despotism, a nation of brothers who bind the weaker one's hand and foot and scourge them with military tyrants and other free brotherly institutions. What a picture! Who would not be an American? One consolation is that this proclamation and the extraordinary care they take to suppress all news, except what they themselves manufacture, proves me that our cause is prospering more than they like us to know. I do believe day is about to break. 
If our troops are determined to burn our houses over our heads to spite the Yankees, I wish they would hurry and have it over at once. Ten regiments of infantry are stationed at Camp Moor, and Scott's cavalry was expected at Greenwell yesterday, both preparing for an attack on Baton Rouge. If we must be beggars, let it come at once. I can't endure this suspense. End of Book Two, Part Three Part four of a Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book two, part four, July eleventh to July twentieth, eighteen sixty two. July eleventh. A letter from George this morning. It was written on the 20th of June, and he speaks of being on crutches in consequence of his horse having fallen with him and injured his knee. Perhaps, then, he was not in the first battle of the 25th? But, bah, I know George too well to imagine he would keep quiet at such a moment if he could possibly stand. I am sure he was there with the rest of the Louisiana regiment. The papers say, the conduct of the first Louisiana is beyond all praise. Of course George was there. And Jimmy is with him at Richmond, but whether in the army or navy, or what rank if in the first, he does not say. He only says he is looking remarkably well. Gibbs he had heard from in a letter dated the 16th, and up to then he was in perfect health. His last letter here was dated 10th of March, so we are thankful enough now. I was so delighted to read the accounts of the gallant 7th in some paper we fortunately procured. At Jackson's address and presentation of the battery they had so bravely won, I was beside myself with delight. I was thinking that Gibbs, of course, was the regiment, had taken the battery with his single sword, and I know not what besides. Strange to say, I have not an idea of the names of the half-dozen battles he was in in June, but believe that one to be Port Republic. June twelfth, thus in the original. Brother writes that rumors of the capture of Baton Rouge by our troops have made him very uneasy about us, and he wishes us to go down to New Orleans if possible. I wish we could. The impression here is that an attack is inevitable, and the city papers found it necessary to contradict the rumor of Ruggles having occupied it already. I wish mother would go. I can see no difference there or here, except that there we will be safe for a while at least. I grow desperate when I read these northern papers reviling and abusing us, reproaching us for being broken and dispersed, taunting us with their victories, sparing no humiliating name in speaking of us, and laughing as to what we'll see when we vile rebels are driven out of Virginia and the glorious Union firmly established. I can't bear these taunts. I grow sick to read these vile, insulting papers that seem written expressly to goad us into madness." There must be many humane, reasonable men in the North. Can they not teach their editors decency in this their hour of triumph? July 13th, Sunday. A profitable way to spend such a day. Being forced to dispense with church-going, I have occupied myself in reading a great deal and writing a little, which latter duty is a favorite task of mine after church on Sundays. But this evening the mosquitoes are so savage that writing became impossible, until Miriam and I instituted a grand extermination process, which we partly accomplished by extraordinary efforts. She lay on the bed with the bar half drawn over her and half looped up, while I was commissioned to fan the wretches from all corners into the pen. 
It was rather fatiguing, and in spite of the numbers slain, hardly recompensed me for the trouble of hunting them around the room. But still, Miriam says exercise is good for me, and she ought to know. I have been reading that old disguster Boswell. Bah! I have no patience with the toady. I suppose my mind is not yet thoroughly impregnated with the Johnsonian ether, and that is the reason why I cannot appreciate him or his work. I admire him for his patience and minuteness in compiling such trivial details. He must have been an amiable man to bear Johnson's brutal, ill-humoured remarks, but seems to me if I had not spirit enough to resent the indignity, I would at least not publish it to the world. Briefly, my opinion, which this book has only tended to confirm, is that Boswell was a vain, conceited prig, a fool of a jackanape, an insupportable sycophant, a uh, whatever mean thing you please. There is no word small enough to suit him. As to Johnson, he is a surly old bear, in short an old brute of a tyrant. All his knowledge and attainments could not have made me tolerate him, I am sure. I could have no respect for a man who was so coarse in speech and manners, and who eat like an animal." Fact is, I am not a Boswellian or a Johnsonian either. I do not think him such an extraordinary man. I have heard many conversations as worthy of being recorded as nineteen twentieths of his. In spite of his learning, he was narrow-minded and bigoted, which I despise above all earthly failings. Witness his tirades against Americans, calling us rascals, robbers, pirates, and saying he would like to burn us. Now I have railed at many of these ordinary women here for using like epithets for the Yankees, and have felt the greatest contempt for their absurd abuse. These poor women do not aspire to Johnsonian wisdom, and their ignorance may serve as an excuse for their narrow-mindedness. But the wondrous Johnson to rave and bellow like any Billingsgate nymph! Bah! He is an old disguster! July 14th, 3 p.m. Another pleasant excitement. News has just arrived that Scott's cavalry was having a hard fight with the Yankees eight miles from town. Everybody immediately commenced to pick up stray articles and get ready to fly, in spite of the intense heat. I am resigned, as I hardly expect a shelling. Another report places the fight fourteen miles from here. A man on horseback came in for reinforcements. Heaven help poor Howell if it is true. I am beginning to doubt half I hear. People tell me the most extravagant things, and if I am fool enough to believe them and repeat them, I suddenly discover that it is not half so true as it might be, and as they themselves frequently deny having told it, all the odium of manufacturing rests on my shoulders, which have not been accustomed to bear lies of any kind. I mean to cease believing anything until it rests on the word of some responsible person. By the way, the order I so confidently believed concerning the proclamation turns out not quite so bad. I was told women were included, and it extended to private houses as well as public ones, though I fortunately omitted that when I recorded it. When I read it, it said, All discussions concerning the war are prohibited in bar-rooms, public assemblies, and street corners. As women do not frequent such places and private houses are not mentioned, I cannot imagine how my informant made the mistake, unless, like me, it was through hearing it repeated. Odious as I thought it then, I think it wise now, for more than one man has lost his life through discussions of the kind. July 17th, Thursday. It is decided that I am to go to New Orleans next week. I hardly know which I dislike most, going or staying. I know I shall be dreadfully homesick, but— Remember, and keep quiet, Sarah, I beg of you. Everything points to an early attack here. Some say this week. The Federals are cutting down all our beautiful woods near the penitentiary to throw up breastworks, some say. 
cannon are to be planted on the foundation of Mr. Pike's new house. Everybody is in a state of expectation. Honestly, if Baton Rouge has to be shelled, I shall hate to miss the fun. It will be worth seeing, and I would like to be present, even at the risk of losing my big toe by a shell. But then, by going, I can save many of my clothes, and then Miriam and I can divide when everything is burned. That is one advantage, besides being beneficial by the change of air. They say the town is to be attacked to-night. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, I was so distressed this evening. They tell me Mr. Biddle was killed at Vicksburg. I hope it is not true. Suppose it was a shot from Will's battery. July 20th, Sunday. Last night the town was in a dreadful state of excitement. Before sunset a regiment that had been camped out of town came in and pitched their tents around the new theatre in front of our church. All was commotion and bustle, and as the pickets had been drawn in and the soldiers talked freely of expecting an attack, everybody believed it, and was consequently in rather an unpleasant state of anticipation. Their cannons were on the commons back of the church, the artillery horses tied to the wheels, while some dozen tents were placed around, filled with men who were ready to harness them at the first alarm. With all these preparations in full view, we went to bed as usual. I did not even take the trouble of gathering my things which I had removed from my peddler sack, and slept, satisfied that if forced to fly, I would lose almost everything in spite of my precaution in making a bag. Well, night passed, and here is morning, and nothing is heard yet. The attack is delayed until this evening, or to-morrow, they say. Woman though I am, I am by no means as frightened as some of these men are. I can't get excited about it. Perhaps it is because they know the danger and I do not, but I hate to see men uneasy. I have been so accustomed to brave, fearless ones who would beard the devil himself that it gives me a great disgust to see any one less daring than father and the boys. I have been so busy preparing to go to the city that I think if the frolic should intervene and prevent my departure I would be disappointed, though I do not want to go. It would be unpleasant, for instance, to pack all I own in my trunk, and just as I place the key in my pocket to hear the shriek of Van Dorn raised again. This time it is to be Ruggles, though. I would not mind if he came before I was packed. Besides, even if I miss the fun here, they say the boats are fired into from Plaquemine, and then I have the pleasure of being in a fight anyhow. Mother is alarmed about that part of my voyage, but Miriam and I persuaded her it is nothing. Oh, if I was a man! Oh, wouldn't I be in Richmond with the boys! What is the use of all these worthless women in war times? If they attack, I shall don the breeches and join the assailants and fight, though I think they would be hopeless fools to attempt to capture a town they could not hold for ten minutes under the gunboats. How do breeches and coats feel, I wonder? I am actually afraid of them. I kept a suit of Jimmy's hanging in the armoire for six weeks waiting for the Yankees to come, thinking fright would give me courage to try it. What a seeming paradox! But I never succeeded. Lily one day insisted on my trying it, and I advanced so far as to lay it on the bed, and then carried my bird out. I was ashamed to let even my canary see me, but when I took a second look my courage deserted me, and there ended my first and last attempt at disguise. I have heard so many girls boast of having worn men's clothes, I wonder where they get the courage." To think half the men in town sat up all night in expectation of a stampede, while we poor women slept serenely. Everybody is digging pits to hide in when the ball opens. The days have dug a tremendous one. The wolves, shepherds, and some fifty others have taken the same precaution. They may as well dig their graves at once— what if a tremendous shell should burst over them and bury in the dirt those who were not killed? Oh, no, let me see all the danger and the way it is coming at once. 
"'Tomorrow or day after, in case no unexpected little incident occurs in the interval, "'I purpose going to New Orleans, taking father's papers and part of Miriam's and mother's valuables for safekeeping. "'I hate to go, but they all think I should, as it will be one less to look after if we are shelled, which I doubt. "'I don't know that I require much protection, but I might as well be agreeable and go.' Oof! how I will grow homesick before I am out of sight. Midnight. Here we go, sure enough. At precisely eleven o'clock, while we were enjoying our first dreams, we were startled by the long roll which was beat half a square below us. At first I only repeated the roll of the drum, without an idea connected with it. But hearing the soldiers running, in another instant I was up, and was putting on my stockings when Miriam ran in in her nightgown. The children were roused and dressed quickly, and it did not take us many instants to prepare— the report of two shots and the tramp of soldiers, cries of double quick and sound as of cannon moving, rather hastening our movements. Armoirs, bureaus, and everything else were thrown open, and Miriam and I hastily packed our sacks with any articles that came to hand, having previously taken the precaution to put on everything fresh from the armoir. We have saved what we can, but I find myself obliged to leave one of my new muslins I had just finished, as it occupied more room than I can afford, the body of my lovely lilac and my beauteous white mull. But then I have saved eight half-made linen chemises. That will be better than the outward show. Here comes an alarm of fire, at least a dreadful odor of burning cotton, which has set everybody wild with fear that conflagration is to be added to these horrors. The cavalry swept past on their way to the river ten minutes ago, and here comes the news that the gunboats are drawing up their anchors and making ready. Well, here an hour has passed. Suppose they do not come after all. I have been watching two sentinels at the corner who are singing and dancing in the gayest way. One reminds me of Gibbs. I have seen him dance that way often. I was glad to see a good-humoured man again. I wish I was in bed. I am only sitting up to satisfy my conscience, for I have long since ceased to expect a real bombardment. If it must come, let it be now. I am tired of waiting." A crowd of women have sought the protection of the gunboats. I am distressed about the Brunos. Suppose they did not hear the noise. Oh, girls, if I was a man, I wonder what would induce me to leave you four lone, unprotected women sleeping in that house unconscious of all this. Is manhood a dream that is past? Is humanity an idle name? fatherless brotherless girls if i was honored with the title of man i do believe i would be fool enough to run around and wake you at least not another word though i shall go mad with rage and disgust i am going to bed this must be a humbug morgan came running in once more in his night gear begging lily to hear his prayers in answer to her why you have said them to-night he says "'Yes, but I've been getting up so often. "'Poor child, no wonder he is perplexed. "'One hour and a half of this nonsense, and no result known. "'We are told the firing commenced and the pickets were driven in twenty minutes before the long roll beat. "'End of Book Two, Part Four.